Genesis chapter 25. We made it as about as far as verse 12. Uh, it, it was the end of Abraham, you know, our father Abraham. And he's, of course, only our father through faith. Uh, passes off the scene. It says in verse 12, now this is the genealogy of Ishmael. And we're going to find this practice through the book of Genesis uh, God's going to deal with the unbeliever and then with the believer and then with the unbeliever and then with the believer and and you know the believer's line is always longer and more detail because that's the line he wants to bring forth but here's Ishmael Abraham's son whom Hagar the Egyptian Sarah's maidservant bore to Abraham and these are the names of the sons of Ishmael would somebody come up and read these for me because you know me in names I just hate names in the Bible by their names, according to their geneal or generations, the firstborn of Ishmael, Nabajoth, then Keter, then Ab Abdeel. I, I need Kaylee to come up here. She could pronounce these with other... Yeah, anyway. Midsham, Mishma. There's some good names. If you're pregnant or if you're thinking about having some kids, you know, Duma, Massa... Heter, Tima, Jephthah, uh, Naf Nafish, Nafish, and Kedemar, Kedemah. These were the sons of Ishmael, and these were their names by their towns and by their settlements, twelve princes according to their nations. And these were the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years, and he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people they dwelt from Havilah as far as Sur, which is east of Egypt, as you go towards Assyria. He died in the presence of all his brethren. Um, Ishmael, was he a believer? Was he not a believer? It's hard to, hard to be dogmatic, right? He grew up under Abraham for 13 years, 14 years, you know, uh, God had promised to take care of Ishmael and this is the proof that he has taken care of Ishmael that he has blessed his life he he comes to 137 years old you know he's gathered to his people that's the same phrase used of Abraham interesting Isaac is going to outlive Ishmael by 58 years and uh he dies, the, the word is he fell. He fell among his brethren or before his brethren. So it seems to be sudden, maybe it's a heart attack, you know, I, I don't know what it is, it's something suddenly. And then verse 19, it says, and this is the genealogy of Isaac. Abraham's son, Abraham begot Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Paddan Aram, the sister of Laban the Syrian. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife <clears throat> because she was barren, and the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. We find out that Rebekah is 60 years old, well, that Isaac is 60 years old when they have this child. So it's been 20 years. <clears throat> Since he got married, they've been trying to have a, a baby, and it hasn't come. And I, I can hear Isaac. Can't you? God, I, I'm the promised child. Abraham's supposed to have this, this downline, like the sand of the sea, like the stars of the heaven. And here we are, we're trying, we're trying, we're trying. No baby, no baby, no baby. What's going on, Lord? You know? Rebecca can't seem to produce any kids. I don't know if it's me. I don't know if it's him. So Isaac pleads with the Lord. Now he may have been pleading for 20 years. Or maybe he just gets to this place where he, he picks a time and he just goes before the Lord and he, he gives his whole heart to it. I, I don't know what, you, what that is. But there comes this place in our lives where we have to understand God's will and God's timing. <laughs> How hard that is when you want a kid. 
how hard that is when you want a new job or when you want something else, you know. And we have to wait. We have to wait. Oh, yeah, we pray. God, what's going on? You know, this is what we want. This is our desire. This is where we're, we want to go. But we can't be like Abraham and Sarah. Sarah lost patience and, hey, go into my handmaid, you know, and let's, let's, make a, let's bring in a third party and, and let's get a baby, you know. Um, is Isaac just reached this place of desperation? God, God it's, you know, come on. I'm 60 years old. What's it going to be like to have a baby at 60 years old? But God does what he wants when he wants. Not our timing, not our will. And, uh, you know, that's an interesting thing to get used to. Husbands, are you making intercessions for your wife? You know, here's something going on, and Isaac's out there in the field praying for what's going on back home. You know, I, I think about my poor, blessed wife. You know, since I became a pastor, she has caught everything there is to go around. She's got it. She gets a double portion because I never catch anything, seemingly. She gets it all. And, uh, you know, there's always some physical thing going on. And I have sought the Lord about that, you know. I'm 62. I, I, Lord, what's going on? You know, I've done that whole thing. Pray for her healing. Pray for her strength. <clears throat> you know, kids were never a problem for us. We would wash our clothes together. She'd get pregnant, you know. So kids were not the issue. But this, this physical thing, you know. There are ways in which the wives carry a load through the family that guys don't carry. We need to be praying for them. Uh, we should be carrying that with them, assisting them with that. You know, what if they're barren? What if they're wanting to get close to the Lord, wanting depth with the Lord, wanting, the, and, and it's not coming? Are you praying for them? that they would have this rich, beautiful, you know, pregnant relationship with the Lord. Um, Isaac prays. He entreats the Lord for that barrenness to go away, and that barrenness does go away. That's the good news, right? Verse 22, but the children struggled. Notice that, the children. <laughs> Right off the bat. We know there's multiples in there. The children struggled together within her. And she said, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. Now, in the King James Version, I, I love it. You know, this is the first mention of twins in the Bible. It, it probably wasn't the first twins. It's just the first ones mentioned. But in the King James Version, it says, she goes, if it be so, why am I thus? Did your wife ever ask you questions like that? Well, if it be so, why am I thus? Wait a minute. Whoa, you know, let's speak English here. And um, how do you answer something like that? She's saying, you know, I know I was barren. And we've been praying about it. You went out and prayed about it. And now I'm not barren anymore. God has blessed. We now have this. But what's going on here? Why if he's blessed me, why, do, why does the blessing look like this? You ever have one of those blessings in your life? You know? Something's wrong inside. Something's wrong with this blessing. So I love this. So she goes to inquire of the Lord. Oh, here's a praying, beautiful woman, right? Both the husband and the wife are seeking the Lord. Both the husband and the wife know how to get things done, you know? Verse 23, and the Lord said to her, and I love this. Oh, I see what the problem is. There are two nations inside of you. <laughs> Did you read that? You know, it's one thing to have two kids. It's one thing to have two little bundles in there. God says, oh, Inside of you, there are two nations in your womb. 
two peoples, two types, two kinds, two, two different manners of people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the other shall serve the younger. The older shall serve the younger. <laughs> oh, you got a big problem, girl. You ask for a blessing, I gave you a double blessing, but it's crazy inside, right? I mean, can you imagine these two? And, and one of them's gonna be known as heel catcher. He loves to wrestle. His whole life is a wrestling match, right? And the other one's a big, hairy, strong man. <laughs> and they're inside. <laughs> uh, the picture, Isaac is this promised son. He's entreated the father, the father from heaven, for his bride who desires to be fruitful instead of barren, and God grants that she would be fruitful but here's the thing. There is never spiritual progress without warfare. Never. You want to grow? You want to push into the things of God? You want to get a little deeper? You want, and guess what? There, there's some struggles coming your way. There's some wrestling going to happen. There's some things that are going to be like, what's going on inside of me? You know, we should cross-stitch that. We should put that on a plaque on the wall, you know? In regards to bearing fruit, putting aside our barrenness without a struggle will never happen. Here's Rebecca, and she's a type of the church. She's a picture of the church, and the Lord says, Rebecca, church, there are now two natures inside of you. Have you noticed that? There's this old nature, the one we were born with, the one we got used to, you know, like me, I lived 33 years in the old nature and never knew anything else, I just did what it told me to do, you know? I did what came natural. <sighs> it's physical, it's fleshly, it's ruled by desires and looks and lust and wants. But for us believers now, there has been a new birth inside of you. There's a new nature now inside of you. <laughs> it's younger, right? The old nature is going to serve the new nature eventually. But maybe, maybe not right out of the box. <laughs> Welcome to the crazy world of Christianity. You wanted it? You asked for it? Poof, now you've got this blessing. When you get saved, one battle ends. But another battle is just beginning. Galatians 5.17 For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these two are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. There's the spirit and there's the flesh and these two are entrenched against each other in a fight for control over you. <laughs> Every believer, and what's, what's crazy about that is there's no third option. I want the easy option, just get rid of this one, or just, you know, there's no third option. This is the option. You're a Christian, this is the case. Every new believer I've ever talked to talks to me about this. <laughs> Well, I was, I was just going to do this, and, and you know, I, I got used to, I, I do this my whole life, and so I got the call, hey, we were going to go do this, and I got the call, and I'm going, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that. And suddenly, there's this thing inside. There's a, there's a new thought. There's the ability to say no, the ability to say yes. I've never had that before. I've just been a slave. I've just, you know, they called, hey, let's go out drinking. I'm on, let's go. And suddenly they call, I'm like, maybe, maybe God doesn't want me to go do that. There's a whole new nature in there. Many 
Christians can get to the point where they think they're schizophrenic. <laughs> There's something going on inside of me. I, it's weird. I got to smile, you know. You got to reassure them. This is the new normal now as a Christian. We're born again. The Spirit of God moves inside. But we still have that old self. We still have that old nature. Yeah. And now we're in a desperate battle. Which nature is going to control you? Which nature is going to win? <laughs> what's, what's fun about it, you know, it's, it's like welcome to Rebecca's life, the, the life of the wife, the life of the bride, the life of the church. Spurgeon says this. He says, dead men don't wrestle. You want proof that you're alive? You want proof that you're born again? You want proof that God's doing something in your life? That wrestling match inside of you is that proof. We should become tigers for Christ because we understand, oh, oh no, he's in there. He's doing stuff, you know? And if he's in there, then I, I just need to surrender to that, to him. Now understand this, we're never to reform the old nature. Because here's what, here's what people love to do is they love to put a suit and a tie on the old nature. Get him all dressed up, put some deodorant on him, brush his teeth, set him out there in public. This is the new me. No, it isn't. That's the old you. You just got him dressed up, you know. You don't dress him up. You don't slap a tie on him. Look how good I look. You know, we, we saw a bunch of those guys at the wedding yesterday, you know. Look how good this old flesh looks. Now, the Bible says, consider that old man dead. Here's how you wrestle with the old man. You put him under your foot and you stomp on him and you keep him down there. Because if you give him an inch, he'll take a mile. He will never be conformed to what God wants you to do, ever. I've been saved for 30 plus years, well, 27 years. And my old man is just as vile and ugly and wretched as it was the day I got saved. There has been no change in my old nature. Romans chapter 6. Likewise you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. We cannot allow that traitor within to control us. <laughs> it cannot sit on the throne of our life one more minute. We've been set free by Jesus Christ from the power of sin. We've been set free from the penalty of sin because he died and paid for that. But there is still the presence of sin that we must deal with. And that's our task in this life, is to walk by the Spirit and not by the flesh to set our minds on the things above and not on the things of this earth. You know, we're to present our members. You know, Romans 12, I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, right? And then the next thing he brings up is your mind is the next thing, you know? Our hands, our, our feet, our mouths. Boy, have you submitted this to him? 
You know, because sometimes the, this, you know, that's why it comes in its own cage. You know that, right? You got to close that cage. Close the cage. Don't let it out. You know, your heart. And here is where the battle rages. As soon as you decide, I'm going to seek the Lord. I'm going to get deeper. Hey, I'm going to try that Bible study. I, I'm going to start coming to Wednesday night. I'm going to, you know, join the Bible study on Sunday afternoon. I'm going to, as soon as you decide you're going to step out, guess what happened? The battle is on. And people soul crack me up because they'll come up to me, oh, Mark, I'm so on fire, I can't wait. I'm going to come to every service. I'm going to come to everything. And you never see them again. And people go, Where, where'd that guy go? He made this dumb promise in his flesh that he was going to do this, and he didn't expect the battle. Oh, there's a battle, and it's coming. <laughs> I always called that my submarine thing because I would, I would decide, hey, I'm going to go to the men's retreat. And, you know, the car would break down, the fridge would break, the, you know, everything that could go wrong went wrong. It would just start crumbling. And I, I call it my submarine. I, I just, I'd set my heart, I'd go underneath, and I'd just push on through. I'm going to pop up at that thing no matter what, I'm going. Because as soon as that stuff started happening, I knew Satan didn't want me to go there. Something good's going to happen there, so I'm going. That's when you're going to run into the resistance. That's when you're going to run into the battle. Part of you doesn't want to do what God wants to do. Part of you, you, your nature, it likes the lazy boy at home, right? I just want to be peaceful, just want to kick back, put my feet up for a while, just relax, you know? It likes its old friends. It likes the ease and the comfort. It says, come on, buddy. You're already saved. Christ died for you. you. You've received him. You're saved now. You know, you don't need to get off the couch and do all of that stuff. You don't need to push in deeper. You don't need to go do all of that. You can be assured if you want to step out and be fruitful, for Jesus, battle's coming. But we need to be like Rebecca was. Battle comes, she can't figure it out what she do, she goes to Jesus. Hey Lord, what's going on with this? You know, I know this is a blessing, I know you're talking to me, I know you're moving in me. Well, why, why, why am I like this? Because there's two natures in you, that's his answer. Two nations, he tells her. Two manner of people. There's an Esau in you and there's a Jacob in you. <laughs> Boy, I, I'd like a good one. You know, can we choose a good one? Well, what we don't understand is there's a, there's a bad one and a good one. There's a bad egg and a good egg. There's a flesh and there's a spiritual in there. One is stronger. It looks like Esau is stronger initially. He is very masculine, domineering, you know? But ultimately, Jacob is going to have the upper hand. The elder, the firstborn, he is going to serve the younger. And we got to remember as we go through this picture, these next few chapters, Rebecca knows that. She's probably told Jacob that. So they know this. So verse 24, it says, So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red. So he was like a hairy garment all over, so they called his name Esau. <laughs> the first one comes out. <laughs> he comes out red and hairy all over, He's like a fur coat. Now, my boys, when they came out, I thought they were part lizard because they changed colors about five times right there in front of me. Like, what? Are they supposed to be purple and then green and then red? And, you know, but I, I didn't have any of this 
furry stuff. You know, our kids were bald until they were like nine, you know? <clears throat> Not quite, but close. This one comes, he's got, he's got like a red fox fur coat on, you know? And it's from head to toe. And they call him Esau, Harry. Well, that's, that's fitting. These are really imaginative parents. What should we call him? Well, let's call him Harry. And then they're going to call him Red, you know, Red Harry. You know, so, you know, it's really fitting. We, we find out just how Harry he was because, you know, later on when Jacob tries to imitate Esau, they have to put goat skin, you know, the goat, goat fur on his, on his hands and arms and on his neck, you know, so when dad feels him, oh yeah, that's my hairy son. Really? He's that hairy? You know? Verse 26. Afterwards, his brother came out and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, so they call him heel catcher, Jacob. And Isaac was 60 years old when they were both born. So the next one comes out, Jacob comes out, and they call him, what should we call this one? Well, look, he's got a hold of that heel. Let's call him that. He's the guy who's always trying to trip somebody up. He's this heel catcher. <laughs> yeah. And I love the way it puts this. And Isaac is 60 years old when twins come into the tent. Thank you anyway, you know? Verse 27. So the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. You know, I had four boys, and they grew way too fast. I get it. But he says, man, they just grew, you know? Next thing you know, Esau's this great outdoorsman, you know? He's a skillful hunter. And the last time we heard something like that was about Nimrod. And there's a bit of foreboding over that name. He's a skillful hunter, whatever that means. He's a man's man. You know, he's that big, hairy guy, you know. He's out there, he's got testosterone, you know, just oozing out of his pores. He's skilled. You see him at Cabela's, you know? He's the guy up there at the gun rack, you know, trying out the new 30 6 or whatever it is, you know? He's got his four-wheeler up in the hills. When it's hunting season, he doesn't take his camper up there. He's tenting. You know, he just got a little tent. He's bag in there. This is all I need. And then you get to Jacob. And Jacob's like the Bobby Flay of the Old Testament, you know? He, he's a plain, he's mild, you know? He, he's dwelling in tents, and you're like, could they be any different? What does plain mean? And you know, you, you, you scratch your head, it's what, what, what kind of picture? Hey, hey neighbor, can you spell neighbor, you know? Is he a guy that likes to change shoes and sweaters all the time? I, it actually means, it's, it's like 11 times in the Bible, 12 times in the Bible, in the Old Testament, this word. Nine times it means perfect. Hmm, that's a whole different picture, right? Two times it means undefiled. One time it means upright. And one time it means mild, right here. There are two kinds of men, two kinds of people in your womb. Think about this. There's one who is out for the kill, out for the thrill of the hunt. He's a man's man. He's, he's hairy. He's, he's about the thrill of the chase. And then the other one is very pastoral. Very protected and covered and godly, dare I say. One is very wired to this world, and the other one has his affections ultimately set on the other world. 
Now, Jacob doesn't do everything right. We're going to read his story and you're going to go, is there any day that this guy is going to catch on and actually do it right, you know? There, he gains this bad reputation, but his desires are right. The way he goes about his desires are totally wrong, but his desires are right. So, you know, he needs some work. Imagine that, a Christian, a believer that needs work. Verse 28, and Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Trouble is in the house now, right? We got our favorites. <laughs> the parents are divided. You know, Isaac loves his boy Esau because he's that great outdoor. He's living through his son out there in the woods, hunting and fishing and, you know, doing all of this stuff. There is no good reason to love one over the other in your families. But Rebecca loves Jacob. These Bible people, they're so human. It's almost like they're real, you know? You remember Abraham and Sarah. Abraham loved Ishmael. Sarah learned to hate Ishmael. Despised him. And Isaac ends up becoming the favored son. Hmm. Many of those reasons were right, but some of them were dead wrong. So Isaac grows up in a house where he's the favored son. And we see that fallout in the household and it's gonna run through their family for generations. Even in a godly family, there's fallout from doing some stupid thing, you know. Us parents pass on a bit of our nature to our family. <laughs> so here, Isaac is the favored one. Isaac's favorite son, Esau, he, he brings home the bacon. He fries it up in a pan, you know, that's the kind of guy I want, you know. And Rebecca, she loves the younger one because he likes to hang around the tents and, and do the thing in the tents where, where she is. And she knows the younger one is going to be blessed. She knows he's going to win out in the end. But there's a curse of sorts, that, that natural bent of the parents. You know, Jacob is going to grow up and, and deceive his father. Actually, he's going to deceive Esau for the blessing. <laughs> he didn't need to. God told him it was coming to him. No need to connive or, or trick or do any of that stuff, but he still connives and tricks to get his way. He's got to learn not to do that. And then he flees to Laban, Rachel's brother, back in Paddan Aran. And there he is deceived. <laughs> he gets a little of his own medicine. And he ends up serving seven years for the wrong bride, and then seven years for the right bride, and then seven years for his inheritance or his, his pay back there. And Laban will change his wages ten times. You know, he, he's in the presence of a real deceiver. Oh, you want to know what it's like to be deceived? Come on over here to Laban's house. I'll show you what it's all about. Then his sons. You think about that. His sons will deceive him about Joseph. What happened to Joseph? Oh, we found this coat of many colors. It's got blood on it. Is that your sons? Oh, shoot, that's too bad. And they're going to have, you know, seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. And you, you notice these things running through the whole story. Families are reliving the bent, the natural bent that started all the way back in Abraham. Isaac comes through Jacob and, you know, Joseph, and it just comes through. I have four boys, <laughs> and I am careful to only have one favorite at a time. You got to be careful, you know. And it's usually the one I'm talking about at that moment, you know. 
I feel for my sons because that Paulson twistedness, that Paulson bent, <laughs> it's, it's powerful. I've been fighting it for like 30 years, actively fighting it. It's stubborn, it's wild-hearted, it's, it's hard-headed, it, it's selfish, and it runs deep. <laughs> my son Matthew, my son Matthew couldn't drive past a car lot without buying one. I mean, literally, you know, every other week he'd go, hey dad, come look at my new truck, I got a new truck, oh hey, I got a car, I got a bike, hey, I got this. Oh, <laughs> He's always wanting the new, the best. There was always this pride, this desire. There's always this thing that was never satisfied in Matthew. And I'm like, I, I, I'm afraid I know what that is. I have that. That's me. It came from my dad, but it's me, you know? That's why I don't drive past car lots. He would say, hey, have you driven past? Hey, have you gone in and seen? No! You know? My son, Perry has this strength and willingness just to stand apart from the whole world. He doesn't care. He will stand there and he will speak his truth. Doesn't matter what anybody else says. <laughs> He'll take on all comers. He has this reason, this logic, this ability, this amazing insight. Oh, would you pray for my sons? Right? Because they got me in there somewhere. My boy, RJ. He has this huge heart, right? I mean, he is so funny and so soft and so caring. He's got this wonderful depth of character. He's so strong. And then I, I think about Ryan, you know? He had this adventurous side to him. He always wanted to try and to do, put his hands on, you know, build and, and you know, He's always pushing, he's always trying, but, but he loved to be alone. He's a loner. I can do it, leave me alone, watch this. I never saw that in you, you know, but um, he was hands-on, he was crafty, he's unique, but he's also so stubborn, you know? And you're just like, I thought there were only two things to opposite. I thought it was this way or this way. I got four and they're all opposites. But the trouble is they've all been infected by their father, you know? So we need to pray for our kids. Can you imagine your kids? They got you inside of them. They're fighting the same things you're fighting. But don't favor them, you know? Whether it's for the flesh, meat, you know? Or because one has spiritual promise. No, 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 don't favor them. Verse 29 says, Now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. Boy, tough day. Is that a tough day out there in the field, little bit, big brother? You know, is it being hard on you? Can you see the empathy? You're going to see it here. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore, his name was called Edom. And here Esau pictures our flesh. When we're tired, when we've had a tough day, when we come in and we're hungry and we're downcast and we're beat up by the world, our flesh says, feed me, right? Just, just take one quick look at the porn thing on the, on the computer. It's just, just a look, you know? You'll wake up three days later after a three-day binge, but, you know, just one, just one look. Just a couple of beers before dinner, you know, that would be cool. Just, just a chance to chill out. Just, just a quick toke, you know, nobody will really notice. Our flesh loves the times when we are weak, when we are tired, when we are wore out, overwhelmed, and it yells, feed me. <laughs> And notice here, they start calling Harry red. They start calling him Edom. Red stew, he's red colored like the ground, he's got red hair, you know, all of these red things come together. But all of these red things point to the flesh. 
<sighs> all these are the natural. All these are the fallen man. We've got to overcome those red things. We've got to overcome that. Of course, we overcome them by a red thing, right? The blood of Christ poured out on red ground. Verse 31, <clears throat> but Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die. So what is this birthright thing to me? Jacob takes advantage of his brother in his weakness. Oh, my big brother, he's pathetic right now. <laughs> he's about to die. Watch this. This is my opportunity, you know. Now notice chapter 26, verse 1, it says, there is a famine in the land. He's been out hunting, there's no water, so the grasses are drying up, so the game has wandered off somewhere where there is grass and where there is water, and hunting's tough in those times. He doesn't have much of an opportunity. <clears throat> Rebecca has probably already revealed to Jacob that you're the favored son, you're going to get the birthright, and so Jacob, in his wisdom, thinks, well, I've got to work for it. Just what we do with God's promises, right? God gives you a promise, you think you have to fulfill it. Wrong! If it's his promise, he fulfills it, not you. But, you know, Jacob's got to learn that. So he's, what's he going to do? He's going to trip up his brother. He's the heel catcher. That's his name. I'm going to do what my nature says to do. I'm going to trip this guy up, steal what he's got, run away, you know? So verse 32, Esau says, look, I'm about to die. What is this birthright to me? What profit is that birthright right now? I'm about to die and you want some inheritance promise? You want some spiritual promise that I could care less about? What, what is that? It's written like Esau doesn't care for it at all. You know, it would be a double portion of the inheritance What's that to me? I'm a man's man. I'm an outdoorsman, you know? I'm a self-made man. I live off the land. What do I need with dad's stuff? You get this kind of arrogance from Esau. It was nothing special to him, but it's more than that physical stuff. It's you become the priest of the household. There's a spiritual blessing that goes with it. You know, so Esau's despising the things of God, the blessings, but Jacob, he has set his, affection, his affections on things above. Oh, his works are wrong. The ways he's going about it are wrong. His heart's in the right place. He knows the messianic promise, the, the one coming down from Abraham. In your seed, all the nations are going to be blessed. The Messiah is going to be born through you, you know. Here's this stuff. Those who bless you will be blessed, and those who curse you will be cursed. And, you know, all of that stuff comes with that promise. Verse 33. Then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold him his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils, and he ate and drank and arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. What a great picture of our flesh. He ate and he drank and he went his way. That's what our flesh does, you know. Hebrews chapter 12 says this, Pursue peace with all people. And holiness, without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Oh, that root of bitterness. You know, how infectious it can be. You know, because misery loves company, right? We don't want to be out there alone, so we invite others in with us. Even in church... They have no thought. These people who are infectious, these people who have this, you know, root of bitterness, they don't think about you. They don't think about me. They don't think about the church as being blood-bought. 
They're just angry. They're just bitter. And they just want everybody to be that way. I'm sorry. You're blood bought. I can't touch that. It goes on to say, Least there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterwards, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. What he sought was the double portion. It doesn't say he couldn't get right with God. That is not what this sentence means. He could always take that lamb and make an offering and be right with God. But he despised it. He wasn't looking for that. There's two reasons it says he despised it. Number one, he was sensual. He was a sensual man. He looked around this world like we look around this world. Can you get away from it? It's on TV. It's everywhere. No matter where you look, there is something that appeals to your flesh. <laughs> and number two, he was profane. It's a great word, profanum in the Latin outside the courts, outside the courts of God. There's no holy place in him. Jacob makes a lot of mistakes, but Jacob's heart is for the spiritual things. It's for the godly things. Esau sold his godly inheritance for a bowl of beans just to satisfy his flesh. It wasn't right or wrong to him. He doesn't care about the spiritual things. So Hebrews warns us in our culture today, danger, danger, Will Robertson, you know. If you're driven by sensuality, if you're driven by squirrel, you know, if you're driven by the bright, shiny, beautiful, whatever it is out there, you know, careful because that can cost you your birthright. Oh, your flesh wants it. We can get there. Oh, it's just, just some sexual gratification. It's just some sexual experience. It's just some fleshly thing I've got to have right now. And we don't count the cost. And as we go that way, we, became, we become profane. We step outside the courts of God. No room for the spiritual thing inside me anymore because it's getting in the way between me and what I desire instead of holding me where I am. You know, Billy Graham, he was in China. <clears throat> and he, he found this uh, dogfighter guy and he was watching this guy. And the fighter guy always knew how to bet on the winning dog. And so Billy walks up to him and says, how do you know? You know, one, one time it's the white dog, one time it's the black dog, one time it's the spotted one, you know. How do you know which dog's going to win? And he says, it's the dog I feed. That dog's going to win. What dog are you feeding? Are you feeding the Esau within you? The fleshly? Are you feeding the Jacob? It, we can so easily compromise here. It's okay. I, I'm saved. God's got me. You know, if I just do this one little thing this one time, it's not a big deal. But what you don't understand is there's baggage that comes along with it. You know? You weaken your resolve. Next time, it's so much easier to give in. Your armor gets some chinks in it. You know, and it's so easy to slip and fall. Do you have a compromise in your life? Step away, determined to walk that higher road. Get right with the Lord, confess to Him, repent. That means turn from your wicked ways, right? Then do what the Spirit is leading you to do. 
Set your affections on the things above. But remember, as soon as you do that, is it going to be easy? Is it going to be slick, smooth? Everything's going to go great? No, no, no. That's when the battle begins. That's when the wrestling happens. So you've got to put on the whole armor of God. Right? And having done all the stand, then stand in that place. You got to read Romans chapter 6. You got to devour it. You got to chew it up. You got to spit it out. You've got to understand what Romans chapter 6 actually says. Christ died for me. I died on that cross with him. My old man is dead. Literally, my old man is paralyzed now. I still hear him calling at me, but he has no power to make me conform to what he wants me to do. So now I submit my members to God. I submit this body to him, my mind to him. We need to pray without ceasing. We need to put some scriptures in the old playbook so when things begin to happen, we can go back and fall upon those scriptures and run them through our minds. Nope, this is where I'm standing. This is why I'm standing here. We need to take those moments and sit quietly with the Lord and listen for his spirit. Lord, where are we going? What's up today? You know, I'm reporting, here I am reporting for duty, Lord. What's on the agenda? What play are we running? When we're new Christians, it's like it is in this passage. There's both these types of men inside of us. Esau is in there. He wants to be strong. He wants to be the doer. He's the skillful hunter, you know. And there's a Jacob inside of there who seems mild, seems plain. The other one's more fun, seemingly. But as you grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, Esau becomes a danger to you. And we must separate from him. We gotta put him under our heel and keep him down there. Because one day that Jacob is going to turn into Israel, right? One day, Jacob, this godly person, is going to wrestle all night with God. Oh, he's going to walk away from that meeting hurt, limping, you know. But he's going to walk away from that. Not Jacob, not heel catcher, not conniver. He's going to walk away from that. The man who chooses to wrestle with God. That's the guy I want to be. I'm the one who has chosen. You know those Ten Commandments everybody's scared to death of? I'm the one who's willing to wrestle through those because I know that actually pictures God's character. And that's what I want to be. I want to put a smile on his face. You know, I've been alive 61 years. Born again 27 years ago. And the older me, the old me, is now serving the newer me. Oh, not perfectly, but it's happened. The old sensual me, the roving eyes and the, the lusts and the desires and always wanting more and better and always wanted to be alone and separated and, you know, that one, the one that's never satisfied, it's coming under control of the new me. That, that profane me, the one that loved to live outside of God's house, outside of the courts, way out there in the dirtiest, the filthiest, you know, the mud, mud piles of this world. The one that wasn't interested in God's word at all, wasn't interested in church at all. The one that wasn't interested in going deeper, or finding more. <laughs> that one's standing up here preaching Jesus. Isn't it funny how that happens? Now both of them, under control of the Jacob in me, actually more than the Jacob in me, under the Israel in me. The one who chooses to wrestle through the word of God. And go, you, you know God, you're right. I'm a sinner to the core. Nothing good is inside of Mark. 
nothing good in my flesh. And I am so thankful that he put his spirit within me when I placed my faith upon him. And now there is something good inside of Mark. But I've got to mine it out of there. You know, it says work out your own salvation. It doesn't mean work for your own salvation. It says it's in there. Now get it out. Let it come out. Let it be real in who you are and what you do. So we stand here. We sit here. We have two natures in us. Which one is ruling your life? Which one are you feeding? That's all you need to know. Which one are you feeding? It's going to win. Father, Lord, what a, what a crazy picture. Two nations in the womb. Two, two natures in the Christian. And yet, Lord, you give us everything to overcome, to be who you've called us to be. God, I am so thrilled that you would save even a wretch like me. And Lord, if you can do that with me, Lord, I, I got a thousand friends out there. Lord, you could touch every one of them. I would say they're worse than me, but I know me. And I know I was always the worst. And yet, Lord, you saved me like as a, as a pitcher for all of those ones out there that, oh yeah, he can forgive you because look, he forgave Mark. Lord, rise up in us. Stir within us. Cause us to choose the Jacob. Cause us to walk in the Jacob. And cause us to trust your promises upon our lives and not try to fulfill them ourselves. Lord, have your way with your church this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.